Hi everyone, I'm Sung Won, aka ProZD, and here I am with Mike Pollock, the very talented Mike Pollock. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for asking. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, I'm going to be asking uh, some questions mainly about voiceover itself, and then I do have some uh, fan submitted questions. Uh, but first of all, um, I want to get this out of the way. Uh, I obviously am I'm a big fan. I grew up with your voice uh, in. Fox Box programs, you know, Ultimate Muscle, Kirby, Right Back At You, Sonic X. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for, you know, being a part of my childhood, I guess. <laughs> thank you. Thanks yeah. for watching. Um, something that a bunch of people have been sort of wondering about is the, uh, when the cast of the Sonic games changed, uh, you were the only member uh, that retained your role. Um, and so my first question is, uh, the Sonic games bef uh, before the shift, were they also directed by four kids, or was that Sonic Team? Uh, for the game, Sonic Team flew in to New York and directed us in New York. Okay, and then now it's uh, Studiopolis doing it now? Studiopolis is there, there's a director, and there are Sega representatives overseeing the process. Uh, the studio itself, if you want to get really technical about it, the mm. studio is Studiopolis, the various... Uh, directors and and other people are freelancers essentially, but Sega's overseeing them. But okay. Right. The actual recording is done in Studiopolis, except for me, which is recorded remotely from some studio in New York. Okay. Um. So, a lot of people obviously they know you for playing Eggman, but uh, is there anything else that you'd like people to know about you in terms of your uh, creative output or any personal projects you have? There's all sorts of stuff. As I'm a freelance, full-service voice actor, so I'm always doing some type of commercial or other cartoon or boring narration that you probably couldn't stand to listen to for more than a minute and a half. Um, weird audio books that I do if I happen to book them. Um, if the time and the muse permit, I will write a song parody or two because I used to do that professionally. Oh, really? Now I now I only do it when I, when I darn well feel like it. Mm. Um, and then I have my little blog project that I have the Celebrity Death Comedy Jam. When celebrities die, I can't help but make uh, witty uh, headlines about them, and I post <laughs> them on a blog. Yeah. Um, I uh, was wondering, what are some of the most maybe um, difficult parts of your job and also some of the most enjoyable? The nature of being an actor is the constant auditioning. I'm a freelancer, so I am constantly working for more work because jobs tend to be very short-lived. So I am constantly auditioning. Mm -hmm. Most of those auditions are met with uh, uh, being ignored. Yeah. So I don't book them, and that's fine. That's the way the business is. But the myth of don't call us, we'll call you is just that. In most cases, here's the audition. I'll hear nothing. And mm -hmm. that's, that's just the way that is. And the hardest part of having a gig is probably, if it's a big screamy character, having to scream at the top of your lungs for several hours. So that'll leave me hoarse for a day or so afterwards. Right. Um, for people um, who are interested in getting into voiceover, um, obviously, um, you know, d trying to deal with rejection when it comes to auditions, how do you have any sort of insight into how you can kind of just get over that or that initial sort of feeling of, uh, you know, uh, discontent? <laughs> Once the audition is over, the audition is over, and you move on to the next one. Whether it's an in-person audition, as soon as you walk out of the booth and walk out of the uh, casting studio, you're done. Yeah. If, they, if they want you, they'll call you. Right. If not, don't worry about it. There's more auditions to worry about in the future. Yeah. Um, do you, um, off the top of your head, is there any particular session that was particularly straining uh, on, your, on your vocal cords? Mm, most of the... Uh, uh, Sonic video games where there's a lot of uh, attacking and yelling and screaming because that's they're paying me to give it my all and I give it my all. Right. But uh, the occupational hazard is when I'm done, I may sound kind of like this for a few days afterwards. <laughs> yeah. And that itself could be a voice. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, I know that on a lot of dubbing work, uh, you're usually working alone. But um, have you? Are there any other voice actors that you've? Um, you know, worked with and enjoy working with, or particularly, you know, had some any good moments with any of them? Uh, the recent ensemble stuff that I've done, most of the Sonic Boom stuff is real time, but not necessarily real place. Oh, okay. Uh, 
couple of times they fly me out to LA, which is really cool. But most of the time, we're all together in the same time frame. But I'm on one coast and everyone else is on the other coast. And we're having a conversation in real time, much like this one. Right. It works quite effectively for the acting part of it. Uh, and then it's assembled later uh, through the magic of digital editing. Um, there's some other stuff that I've done. I did a thing for Duart recently called Pixie Post. Okay. It's some um, Basque Spanish production where they decided it, it would be fun to not only record ensemble style, but also to record as if it were a live production, even though it was voiceover. Okay. So we were wearing lavalier microphones clipped to ourselves, and there were boom mics overhead, and we had some type of movement as if it were a stage production. Oh, okay. And that was fun working in close quarters with people for four days out of a week. Um, that is the exception rather than the rule, but right. acting is reacting, so it's always more fun to have people in person to react with yeah mm -hmm. um are there any um sort of memorable moments you've had while meeting fans i'm sure you've I mean, obviously you've met you know hundreds over the years at conventions and that's at that sort of thing so any any good any either positive or negative any memorable moments you remember uh the memorable moments are occasionally uh if i'm in town for a while and there's a uh for example it, it, this Earlier this month, I was in Columbus, Ohio at a comic book store for free comic book day. Okay. And I had what amounted to a posse mm -hmm. of uh, a handful of people who took me out to dinner, which was lovely. We sat and chatted, uh, got a couple of meals. We even went uh, back to uh, someone's home and watched the incredibly awful Ratatouille uh -huh. that I appeared in as four different roles. I do have a question about that later. <laughs> excellent. Uh, and it was, it, it was interesting to see it with people and mm -hmm. see the whole thing through, which I hadn't done before. Um, so that's really cool to be able to, to spend extra time with uh, the more devoted of the fans. Um, and then the creepy experience that I like to share uh, was a fan who was really more interested in meeting Dan Green more than me, oh. but... I was available, right. and I said, if you want to meet me, I'll be working at Starbucks. I had some computer work to do in between <laughs> gigs, so I said, come and visit me at Starbucks. I'll be there for an hour. I'll buy you a coffee. She came by. She bought a coffee. Yeah, or I bought a coffee for her. It was lovely, mm -hmm. and then I had to go to a session at Four Kids, and I said, if you'd like to, you can follow me to the doorway of Four Kids, but then I go upstairs, and you don't, Right. except it turns out that she did. Ooh. I went in for a session, and I was uh, on my way out of my session. The studio manager stopped me and said, did you say someone could come up and have a tour? And I said, no. What are you talking about? Oh, you mean her. So she just kind of snuck up there. She snuck up there and asked for a tour, which it's an office building. They don't normally give tours right. unless it's prearranged, and it's usually part of a group. But yeah. I got a nice little talking to her saying, don't ever do that. Which was, <laughs> that was fun. That uh, uh, sounds rough, but um, mm -hmm. overall, I'm sure you've had pretty positive experiences most, yes, most for the of most, those fans. Yeah. For the most part. Right. Facebook and other social media can get rather invasive with people that oh, want yeah. to chat at all hours of the day or night, but I've learned to deflect some of the odd hour requests. Right. Um, are there any misconceptions about you or about or either about you or about you as an actor or about the art of voiceover itself that you'd like to kind of clear up? Most people assume that I'm a Sega employee and that I report to Sega every day mm. from 9 to 5, sit at a desk and do Eggman things. No. Yeah. I'm a freelancer. I work for whoever will hire me whenever they will hire me. Uh, my Sega stuff uh, recently with Sonic Boom amounts to uh, two four-hour days per month on average. Mm -hmm. That's hardly a full-time job. That is part-time hourly work. But that is supplemented by lots of other part-time hourly jobs in between, which is why I'm constantly auditioning, constantly looking for work and if i'm lucky constantly booking jobs which i will then have time to do at other times of the week for example tomorrow i'll be going to narrate uh another in a series of uh, financial related e-learning programs about loan factoring and underwriting of loans mm -hmm. uh extremely boring to the average layman but uh, i was hired because i can make boring material sound interesting i mean hey it's a job you know <laughs> and Why the challenge the challenge of taking boring material and making it interesting is my equivalent of gaming. Right. That's a puzzle to solve in itself. Yeah. Um, I got to say, though, when I did hear your voice in the Sonic Boom uh, animated trailer, I was pretty thrilled. Uh, I don't really keep up, actually, with any of the new Sonic games, but um, I did kind of grow up with you in Sonic X, and so getting to hear you again, and it looks, it looks really, actually really good, the, the show. 
The show is hysterical. That's pretty much all I can say about it. Oh, yeah, right. Um, now, have there been any moments um, in a voiceover performance that sort of really kind of struck an emotional chord with you? Um, probably one of the most interesting uh, was... I would say early in my career, because I guess technically it was as far as being early in the animation career. Mm -hmm. 2002 or three or something, I was recording um, a direct-to-video thing, which is supposed to be a theatrical release, but never happened, okay. called Jungle Emperor Leo, mm -hmm. which is the sequel to Kimba the White Lion, oh, the okay. 60s right. anime. Yeah. And that there's been much dispute over whether Disney stole the plot or the plot was stolen for, from Disney, but pretty sure it's the other way around. But that's a controversy for another time. Yeah, and that was a uh, interesting dub because uh, the lovely and talented Michael Center Nicholas is at NYAV Post called me and said, "I have this last minute gig. We have two days to dub it. I want you to be in it." I said, "Okay, great. When can you come by?" Well, I can come by tomorrow night, which is when he happened to have time. Mm -hmm. So I arrived at the studio at about 8 o'clock. We started recording this thing. And it, the session itself went well, be, well past midnight because there was so much stuff to do. And there were some technical hurdles to get through. And mm -hmm. we're adapting the script on the fly. Right. And around about midnight, he said, Want to give up for the night? I said, no, no, we've come this far. Let's finish this thing through. Yeah. Um, and the booth, as I recall, got really hot, so I ended up the last hour or so I was shirtless in the booth because that was <laughs> the only way I can get through it. And uh, it was a fairly emotional moment in the film by the end of uh, by the end of the production. So the raw emotion fueled by the heat was quite real. It was all, all real. <laughs> exactly, and it came out to be a spectacular production, which I think was greatly underappreciated. It's available for sale on my website. If you got some spare, some spare scratch, pick up a copy. It's a brilliant show. So you directed, who did, did, who did you play in it? I played Dr. Mustache. Oh, okay. An explorer who uh, finds the lion cub and his father and stuff happens. And who, who, else, who else was in that? Uh, Jamie, the lovely and talented Jamie McGonigal was in that as my assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Green, I believe, voiced the head lion, uh, the late uh, and uh, lovely forgotten, but gone but not forgotten, Matty Blaustein. Oh, yeah played uh, a woolly mammoth, as I recall, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of New York names you must know. Um, did you, um, speaking of Maddie Blostein, did you um, get to work with her in any capacity? Or I, I, I guess you do a lot of dub, you did a lot of dub work, but mm -hmm. did you ever get to meet her or um, get to... Sure, as with most other New York actors, especially at the four kids' time of uh, life, we passed each other in the hall. I'd be coming in, they'd be coming out. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Got to go to work. Great to see you later. Bye. Yeah. So there's a lot of three or four minute conversations with lots of people, and Maddie was no exception. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, great fun to chat with on those brief occasions when I had the opportunity right. to do so. I do remember you being um, the narrator of Pokemon for a bit uh, uh, yeah. after the original guy left. A couple of seasons, I, I refer to myself as the interim narrator because yeah. the original guy left. I was brought in, and then four kids lost the whole deal, yeah. and uh, it went back to other places where then the original guy could start doing it again. So I consider myself the filling between the original guy sandwich. Well, you did a really solid job just Thank you. when you had it. Um, okay, I think maybe we can – I have I've, I've got like a bunch of uh, – submitted questions i i gave them your faq so i tried mm -hmm. to sort of sift out stuff like that's already been kind of answered in the past cool um um some so some of uh, a few a few people were asking about um the whole cast change and you keeping your role um platonic waffles asks uh how was it when you found out you were the only voice actor kept on during the cast change and were you surprised yeah uh, there was an, an interesting process involved the first interesting thing was when I got uh, a call from one of my uh, managers on the West Coast at the time, mm -hmm. and she said, well, I've got this audition for a thing for you, and they said it's something you've done before. It's a Dr. Egg man. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, I thought I was still doing that, but yeah, I'm familiar with it. Um, so they sent me, just like a regular audition, specs and sides. Uh, specs being the description of the character, kind of which I knew. Right. And sides, which was dialogue, much along the lines of stuff I'd already said. Yeah. And I recorded an audition, essentially doing what I had been doing for the past 
seven or so years at the time. And they submitted it. And uh, I found out a couple of weeks later that I was booked for a session. Yeah. I guess was good. Right. Um, the footnote, which was interesting, is that the L.A. lady had no concept of time zones. Mm. So she said, you've got a booking. It's uh, Tuesday, 9 o'clock. Is okay. that 9 o'clock Pacific time or 9 o'clock Eastern time? Because that does make a difference. 9 o'clock. All righty. Just 9 o'clock. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So I, rather than argue with her, I showed up at the studio at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're not supposed to be here for three more hours. I said, uh, that's what I figured. If you need me, I'll be at Starbucks until noon. <laughs> and then I got there, and uh, the session started as normal. And I didn't ask a lot of questions because I generally prefer to be in the uh, need-to-know basis. If they have something to tell me, they will. Mm -hmm. But the one question I kind of had to get out of the way was, Am I the only one? Mm. And the reason that was important was because chances are I'd be running into other people from the New York cast who would bring things up in conversation, yeah. and I didn't know what I could tell them about and what I could not. Right. And the response I got was, you're the only one as far as I know, according mm. to our lovely director, Jack. And uh, so there was an initial moment of, oh, thanks. Now <laughs> let's move on, because I was there to work, and I did work. So did they even, like acknowledge that you were already Eggman before or was it just kind of like you know oh we'll just treat it just like a regular audition was there any hint at all that they mm, knew uh, just the agent told me it's something you'd done before and yeah. I said yeah it was I thought I was still doing it mm. but other than that it was just a regular plain old audition Okay. and I responded to it just like isn't that interesting suddenly I might not be doing this that's fine yeah. but Fates being whatever they were, I they they picked me again. And that was just spectacular. You're just you're just too good at the job, I guess. It's... Didn't ask, but from what I've heard, they're quite happy with uh, with what I've done. So that's nice. That's good. Um, and I guess in a similar vein, um, how does it feel to be the most to be the most consistent of all the Sonic voice actors yeah. in the Sonic franchise? It's a great honor. Well, and that's not entirely true because remember, you got to consider the Japanese voices oh, true, many of them yeah. have been going but as far as english side uh ten and a half years uh wow. longest running english voice so i guess that's a footnote in history nice um another question is uh, throughout the stuff that you've been in do you happen to have a favorite line or at least one that you genuinely like my stance on favorite lines i'll usually point out that uh, I have a script in front of me, and I have no reason to remember lines, yeah. so I don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't end up hearing, I'm not playing the games and watching the, sh the shows over and over again like a typical fan, so right. I don't hear my dialogue over and over again. Um, but if I had to pick a favorite sound, and it, there is one from uh, one of my early and most memorable characters, which is me from Ultimate Muscle. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. My first recurring major character in a series. And Meat uh, had a little reaction that... Uh, the typical anime dubbing reactive, huh? which is has become cliche. Yeah, and it did say huh in the script, but to me, with his New York truck driver voice that he had, his huh became huh. <laughs> Love that sound. Always have. Always will. I was just transported back. <laughs> like ten. See? Was, was that ten years ago? Like, yeah. Even longer. Uh, I, man, just two thousand one, two thousand two. It's crazy to think about. That was a really underrated show. I thought. Or, uh, yes, it definitely had its moments. Yeah, it was great. Um, <laughs> so, I guess um, going off what you said of like you know people might ask you what your favorite line is. Uh, how do you sort of? Because I'm sure fans will come up to you and say, "Oh, I loved you as you know." broom number two in this cartoon sh like one episode of a cartoon show and of course you know you've played so many roles over the years you don't remember every single thing how do you kind of deal uh with that you know to in a do you do it kind of like gently like oh i don't really remember or how do you sort of handle that it depends on the role if it's something that i genuinely don't remember i i'll say i genuinely don't remember that but i'll take your word for it mm -hmm. uh there are a couple of things which i haven't thought about for a while but suddenly they'll They'll be a bit familiar and like, oh, yeah, that was that thing with, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then thanks to the internet, there are some things that weren't me. Uh, oh. Wikipedia and other sources, for example, have said that I played General Blank in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm. No, no, I did not. I played definitely a couple of characters, including the Garbage Man and Kirby, not the pink, round, lovable <laughs> Kirby, but 
uh, the character loosely based on on uh, legendary comic artist Jack Kirby. Mm. Um, but uh, those I played, but there were some characters that I've been credited with in that and in Yu-Gi-Oh! that, no, they weren't me. So, okay. And I've given up trying to change them. I know I can change those listings myself, but I don't bother. It's, it's not, not worth worrying about, basically. No, not you know. at all. Right. Um, uh, what does Takumi say, uh, asks, is it surreal hearing yourself in things? Like, do you ever hear yourself as Eggman coming out of a kid's game system and just stop in your tracks? Like, how did I get here? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> That happens with my kids when they're playing their various Nintendo 3DS games. They oh, have, yeah. They have colors and generations and similar games, and I hear myself coming out of the backseat far too often. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's really cool. Um, I remember back in my radio days when I was first doing some outside work, uh, not on the radio station, um, I was shopping in a drugstore, and I heard uh, a commercial for a local amusement park that I was doing. I said, hey, everyone, that's me. No one else in the store cared, of course, but right. I, I said, isn't that cool? Yeah. And on a recent audition, I was in the room with dozens of other people waiting to audition for some commercial, mm -hmm. and I heard on the radio a, com a commercial that I had just voiced playing on the commercial on the radio. And I was so tempted to say, hey, everyone, that's a job that I booked. That would be pretty obnoxious. But it just to intimidate everyone else in the room. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got this. I got this. Yeah, back. it just it made me smile to myself, and that's yeah. all that mattered. Um, do you do any live action work at all, or is it all just voice? Um, I've done very few on camera things. I did a local cable commercial once when I was in Syracuse, New York. Okay. Um, and then the promotional stuff that I've been doing for Sonic, Sonic Boom, they've been doing some on camera behind the scenes stuff, and that's been fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was community theater and a couple of dinner theater things that I did. But mostly I like the short attention span, lack of makeup and wardrobe, um, get it over quick and move on to something new and exciting uh, feel of voiceover. Right. So that's been my forte, especially as an old radio guy. And I can My voice can do lots more things than I can do on camera. And I'm going to end up booking a lot more voice roles because you don't have to look the part for voiceover. Exactly, yeah. I think, you know, it's great because, you know, you don't, you're not, you know, judged by how you look or anything like that. It's all just really just based on your talent, which I exactly. think is a great thing about voiceover. And for most auditions, there's, you don't even submit a headshot and or resume. They, all they want to hear is they want to hear you read their specific audition. And if they like how you read it, then you book the job. Yeah. Um, is there a character um, that you, that you consider kind of like the most far away from like you as a person? Ella the Maid. <laughs> I forgot you did that. <laughs> Most people do if they even knew it at all. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, Thank you. Uh, the next question, um, going back to uh, Ratatouille, um, here comes the Yosh asks. Um, so apparently you were in both Ratatouille and the Little Panda Fighter. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And okay. little little cars and several others in that. Okay. In that genre. Could you tell us um, what doing uh, video Rikendo movies were like behind the scenes? Um, it's essentially another job. There's a particular dubbing studio in New York who specializes in the quick and dirty mm. and, uh, and abusing the talent when he's directing you. <laughs> and the main reason people work for him is because he'll give you a check when you leave. Right. And I rely on him to fund my Starbucks addiction more than anything else. <laughs> but once you've done enough work for him... All of his jobs tend to blend in together, yeah. and they're all of somewhat mediocre quality. And your job is not to judge the quality of the material because they're paying you to do a job. So you mm -hmm. walk in and you do the, do the job, presumably to the best of your ability. Right. And uh, it's just another thing. So that was two hours of reading another poorly adapted script that had to be rewritten on the fly, just like most of the stuff that he does. Yeah. And it didn't stand out as any better or any worse than anything. My only specific memory, other than with Ratatouille playing four different characters and watching it and saying, wow, those were four discrete characters that didn't all sound like me. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's good. Exactly. That's He wanted me to do my versatility thing, and that's what I did. And then the other one with um, the panda fighters thing, mm -hmm. I remember my character, just the animation looking like a sack of flour. <laughs> Isn't that interestingly poorly animated? But whatever, I'm there to read the script, and that's what I did. So it's just one kind, of basically like one guy's vision. Is that kind of how it is over there? 
the guy bids for foreign jobs, and I assume he comes in as the lowest bidder, which is fine, <laughs> yeah. passing the savings on to us, the talent sometimes, the, depending on the rate that he's paying. But yeah, he gets the scripts, he adapts them either himself or someone else, paying, uh, working at slightly slavish wages, mm -hmm. and uh, he brings us in for a quick and dirty record session, uh, sometimes yelling at us just to get the stuff done as quickly and efficiently as possible, <laughs> and then he mixes it down and ships it out, and that's all we heard of it. And that's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got paid, right? Sure. So that's as I walked out the door. Yeah. I think. I mean, I think a lot of people will like go, "Oh, why would you do something like that?" And it's really because you get paid. I mean, it's. I mean, it's good work, and you get paid. I don't think people. People seem to think that a lot of voiceover artists have the luxury of just, "Oh yes, I'll just. Um, I'll pass on all of these things just because I don't feel like it." You know. I, I'm a glorified electrician. You don't. You know, when you're, it doesn't matter whether you're there to swap out an outlet or rewire a home. You take the work because someone calls and wants you to come and do the work. Right. Um, Sam Clifton has a couple questions. Um, first off, um, what was your favorite production to work for uh, in stage and radio or as? Oh, first of all, have you done any stage work? Uh, community theater and, and theater theater specifically, but yeah. Okay. So, um, do you have any favorite productions out of stage, radio, or voiceover? Uh, I could probably pick uh, in all of the genres. Uh, okay. Stage, I had the joy. I like rep reprising roles, either uh, the same role that I've done before in a that comes up as a sequel many years later, mm -hmm. which I've done for uh, most recently for Berserk, uh, an anime series. I did it years ago, mm -hmm. years ago meaning within the last 10 years. And then a couple of years back, they came back with more of it, and they were nice enough to round up the old gang. So that was nice to be remembered and to get to reprise that role. Yeah. Uh, in dinner theater, I played uh, – actually, in uh, in college, I played Bud Frump, the uh, – the obnoxious uh, nephew and how to succeed in business without really trying oh, the role okay. originated on Broadway by Charles Nelson Reilly. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, four people will appreciate that, and that's fine. And I got to reprise that role uh, a couple of years later in dinner theater, and I and I was lucky enough to audition and, and rebook it much, I guess, like Sonic, uh, like Doc Regman in, in Sonic, uh, the Sonic franchise. I re-auditioned and rebooked the role. Different production at this point, but obviously I was able to bring my previous experience to the audition and say, look what I did before, I can do it again for you. Yeah. And that was nice enough to, uh, they were nice enough to rehire me for that and I got to reprise her role. So that was fun. I've got a soft spot in my heart for Brett Frump. Should mm -hmm. that possibility of replaying that role ever arise, I'd be happy to do it in almost any, uh, any uh, venue. Right. Uh, radio, I spent a long part-time career in Syracuse, New York where part-time wages weren't so great, but the people were spectacular. Mm -hmm. I had fond memories from 1986 to 1993, uh, that period of my life I look back very fondly because radio was still fun, the people were still fun, and I got to have lots of sometimes boring grunt work, but the on-air stuff that I did and the, the commercials that I was able to be part of were tons of fun, and that had tremendous... Uh, impact on what would become my future career right um and as far as uh voiceover stuff sonic boom is going to be hysterical <laughs> it's as i've said before and i will continue to say it it's been a it's been a tremendously fun ride over the past almost two years now i guess since we first did the first proof of concept yeah. and played around with the initial uh, script to see what we can make of it and to get to go back to a studio every uh, couple of weeks and and if not see people in person at least to react with them and laugh and scratch and joke around in real time and laugh at some hysterically funny scripts is tremendous i cannot wait for this uh series to start airing and continue airing if we're lucky for a long time mm -hmm. um who uh is your favorite narrator that's another question he had um, that's an excellent question. Uh, Bill Scott on the, uh, no, that was not him. I lied. He played Bullwinkle. Uh, Robert Conrad. No, oh, that's a lie as well. Right. William Conrad. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. If there's editing, we'll edit that and pretend. Right, we'll we'll just get that out in post. Yeah. It's late. Uh, William Conrad, uh, who TV fans would remember as the extremely large and obese detective canon from his later TV work. Mm -hmm. But, uh, his... His hyper narration on the Rocky and Bullwinkle series never ceased to amaze me, uh, just because it was so brilliantly bizarre. And uh, I would probably pick him as my favorite narrator. 
Right. Um, I know we have um, we're kind of getting close to the to the end, um, but I did want to try to cover a few more questions quickly, and then we'll be we'll we'll wrap it up. Sure, we should be able to exhaust the supply. All we're right. okay so far. Yeah. Um, do you ever get in touch uh, with any other voice actors from past projects you've worked on? Not intentionally, but we'll cross paths as far as various productions. For example, I bumped into. Uh, the lovely and talented Jason Griffith uh, mm. on uh, doing some waller work for some movie he's in about zombies. He is appearing on camera, and they needed some extra zombie effects, so a bunch of us gathered around into a studio one day and spent an hour or so going, <laughs> which, was, which was an interesting experience, but that was fun. Um, but if we happen to pass each other, either on auditions or recording other projects, it's always great to see them. But our schedules are so weird and unpredictable that it's tough to make time to see people as often as you might like. Right. Um, and then here's um, a question from uh, Shala Kitty. Um, I know that voice acting is your work, but obviously one of the joys of it is that it can be so much fun. So um, do you have a scene that stands out as kind of the most fun you've done? Um, a couple of things in Sonic X really stood out. Sonic X obviously having had a large impact on future careers as well. Yeah. Uh, there was a scene in, in Sonic X where at one point Dr. Eggman broke the fourth wall in the most bizarre of ways, uh -huh. answered a live phone call from a viewer, which is impossible on so many levels. <laughs> but I enjoyed the fact that the phone rang and he got to answer the phone with a hearty, hello, <laughs> made, just made me laugh. Yeah. Um, and then there was an interesting scene toward the last couple of episodes of the series where you got to have a very tender, heartfelt moment with the Everyone Hates Chris Thorndike character. <laughs> um, and that was just nice to see him play a different part of a different type of role than the usual bombastic, yelling, evil villain. He actually had a, a tender side. Right. It's good, and, good to see his soft side. Sometimes. Sure, exactly. Yeah. And then a lot of the stuff that, that is yet to be seen in Sonic Boom. There's a lot of stuff that you've not seen him do before, and it's great to be able to bend the canonical restrictions of a character. Huh. Uh, when does that come out? Do you know? Um, in the fall, whenever okay. the fall may be, which is, I guess, any time between September and December, if fall means what fall means. Do you know what channel it'll on be on? Cartoon Network. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um is there anything that you're in now that we can hear you in, or anything in the future that you're allowed to talk about besides Sonic Boom? Stuff that's in production and not yet released, I tend not to talk about. Right. Because some things are under non-disclosure agreements, and other things probably should be but aren't. Uh, but if you go to my YouTube channel, which is It's a Mike, mm -hmm. I-T-S-A-M-I-K-E, there's a playlist there called The Sound of Mike, which has... Uh, a bunch of interesting stuff that ended up being on YouTube, and I've assembled it into a playlist. Yeah. And there's other stuff on my website on the videos page of itsamike.com. Um, and uh, that's probably the easiest way to look for stuff. Okay. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, and uh, obviously you don't have to if you don't want to, but are you willing to do any sort of Eggman-related voice requests, or is that kind of like not something you want to... Uh, tackle right now. Without explicit permission, the only stuff I could really do is generic stuff like, I'm Dr. Eggman! <laughs> so that's for people who don't believe that it's me. That was me. That's, that's good enough, honestly. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think that should be good. Uh, thank you uh, for you know taking the time to sit and chat. Not a problem. Thanks for asking. My pleasure. Um, do you, you, uh, your website is itsamike.com? It is. And then, um, do you have any sort of social media or... Uh, both Facebook and Twitter uh, are also both It's a Mic, so is Google Plus for that matter. Um, and um, the website always has stuff happening and links to the blog and other other stuff. Yeah. So it's all it's all just It's a Mic. Just exactly right. Whenever clear, it's easy to get to. Okay, sounds good. Exactly right. Um, do you have anything that you would like to say to people who are uh, who want to pursue a voiceover? Not not necessarily advice, but just sort of you know like something um, you'd want to say to anyone listening out there. Sure, make sure that you've got acting experience because if just because you can do wacky voices, if you can't put the acting behind it, that's really just boring wacky voices. You've got to be able to take the voices and make them real and larger than life and leap off the page. Right. So do community theater, school theater, any type of theater experience. Then build a list of characters and, and get a professional demo together. If you can either have the disposable income or have someone give you some disposable income mm -hmm. to get real-life coaching 
and a coach will usually help you produce uh, produce a professional demo reel. Get that done because a professional demo reel with music and sound effects sounds a lot better than here are some voices I recorded in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> No one's going to book you from that type of room. Right. Yeah. Um, and also remember that there's more to voiceover than just wacky cartoons and, and animation and games. There's straight narration. There's commercials. There's promo. There's e-learning. There's audiobooks. Anything that needs a voice, voicemail prompts on, on phone systems. People need vo- all sorts of voices. So be prepared to expand your horizons because you can't always make a living just on doing wacky cartoons. Yeah, right. I think a lot of people have that kind of um, sort of I- idealistic, like oh, I just want to do fun cartoon voices, but really, it's not. It's not all just that, and you have to re- kind of you know be real about what you you know, are willing to do. Exactly, and, and no matter how boring the job might seem, someone's paying you to read. Exactly. How great is that? Best gig in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Um, and even if the the gig is crappy, it will end sooner rather than later. And you'll you'll get you'll get paid. So exactly, I, I, the eleven hour audio book took me six six hour days, Oof. long, exhausting. And by the time I was done for the day, I had no interest in seeing that book ever again. <laughs> but eventually, it was done, and that's that, and I survived. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, just you know t- taking the time to chat. Um, no problem. Thanks, I, I'm really. I kind of am. You know amazed that you would actually just you know are you're willing to talk to people on skype and i think that's just a great thing in itself you know very words, generous of your of you and your time words i have adopted from one of my radio gigs uh the legendary rochester new york morning man brother wheeze don't ask um had a, a sign-off phrase that uh, he used and i realized that it ends up applying to uh, me as a semi-celebrity with fans he would always sign off with it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. So if you can spend at least a few minutes giving someone the time of day and chatting for up to half an hour on, on online uh, Skype type of things, then do it. Because even if it's something you wish you hadn't started talking to, it's done in half an hour. And <laughs> long. Well, I'm definitely glad that uh, I, took, I took this half hour with you. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm thank good. you. Um, and uh, ha- have a good evening. Likewise, I'm through. Hello, I talk for a living. Likewise, I'm sure it's late. <laughs> oh, it, it's all good. Perfect. All right, take care. Bye bye.